Welcome into Other People's Shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we get to today's episode, a little message from my friend, Katie Horner. Katie, take it away. The event of the year for Christian business owners is just around the corner. Handprint Legacy Live 2021 is virtual this year, which makes it super easy to attend from anywhere in the world without makeup, long flights, or expensive hotel rooms. Thursday through Saturday, June 24 to 26, we'll spend three powerful days mapping out your first or next most important steps for your business. I'm Katie Horner. My husband and I have grown from full-time ministry in Mexico to full-time international business owners by understanding and solving the countless marketing challenges faced by Christian entrepreneurs. We created the Handprint Legacy Live event as a safe haven where small business owners, teachers, authors, and coaches strategize, implement, and grow their business. This event is highly interactive and tickets are limited. Grab yours today before we sell out because three days of Bible-based fun and marketing instruction is going to leave you with your next marketing funnel all mapped out. Register now for the 2021 event at handprintlegacylive.com. That's right. If you are interested in this amazing event, please, of course, check out our show notes now. There will be more details on that there. And without further ado, Lucas, take it away. Hey, come take a walk with me. Not like you used to do. Do something different. Put yourself in other people's shoes. Open up your mind and open up your eyes and change your direction. Welcome to Other People's Shoes, as you know. I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for joining me today. Super excited to sit with our guest today, because how often do you get to say that your guest has been featured in Oxygen Magazine? That's right. I believe that's Oprah's Magazine, if I'm not mistaken. Of course, you can fact check me at OPSpodcast.com. Just you know, drop me a little note and say, hey, Neil, you were correct. It is Oxygen Magazine is Oprah's. She's also been featured on Shape.com. She is also an international speaker. She's also helping people as an intuitive life coach. More on that to follow, I'm sure. So I don't know about you perfectionists out there. Raise your hand on that. She's helping those who are perfectionists. In fact, helping my friends who are perfectionists overcome that self-judgment by taking consistent aligned actions to fix their relationships. Who couldn't need some help there? She has a background as a microbiologist, neuroscience, and in psychology. She provides the framework for incremental success. She also says this, which I think is so fascinating. She says it's not about being perfect. It's about practicing your potential. Help me welcome her in all the way from Fayetteville, North Carolina, home of the Tar Heel State, Cami Kennedy. Cami, how are you today? I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, I was just being honest. I, I have no allegiances to any sports teams and my Pittsburgh family, I upset them. Cause I'm like, eh, you know, I moved, I moved to San Diego when I was 19, 20. And then I was like, do I like the chargers? And then I was like, no, nah, I just don't really, I have other things to do. So I, I feel like you can carry it for me. I'll carry it. Oh, absolutely. I'll carry it for you. I, I do want to, we're on a zoom right now. So, so those that are listening don't know that specifically, but we're on a Zoom now. I don't often do this, but I'm going to compliment you on your earrings today that they are kind of light blue in nature. She didn't even know that before she got on, but but she did she did maybe in her mind think, well, he loves North Carolina, even though he lives in Oregon. It's very weird. People struggle with that. But but Cammie, I'm, I'm excited to have you today because I think we're going to have a great conversation and I hope people are really tuned in to hear, I think, some amazing truths that you have that I think are really going to help them get unstuck in their particular moment right now. Just to help. I don't know about you, but as a little girl, well, l- let's stop. I'm going to pause that for a second. We're going to come back to when you were a little girl. But we got to get this most important question out of the way, and that's this. Is, Cammy, what style of shoe do you like to wear? Interesting. Because I have different vibes, and I don't like to be put in a box. So I'm really liking the jogger vibe with, like, a nice little, like, I like a travel attire. So I like to wear a jogger. I like to wear a tennis shoe. And then I am 5'3". So I do like to wear a boot with a heel or like a nice wedge. So it depends on the situation, but I will say I have many more than just one or two pairs of shoes. So I have some for every occasion. Do do you have like a estimate on how many maybe pairs there are in the, in the lineup? 
I've done really, I've done really well because since I moved in with my husband, uh, we share a closet and I used to have my own closet. So I pared down, but let's say 30, I mean, 30, 40, I'm not sure, but 30 is a good estimate. I would say. Okay. I am not sitting on a seat of judgment because as a dude, I have like 50 Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a problem, well, right? Again, judgment, right? It's okay. Stage, I mean, I know you're kind of a life coach, own. so I mean, I yeah. don't know if that's, I don't know if that's in your wheelhouse to maybe help life coach me out of that. But I'll tell you, there's a girl that I know, and her name is Elizabeth. That just cost me a dollar. That would probably like me to maybe have less shoes. So I don't know if you know somebody in your life coaching, you know, right? Database. And that's, that, yeah. That's how you find out if it's a problem is, is it affecting your life and your relationships? So that, that may be. Ooh, we're yeah. getting nuggets already. Yeah. Look at that folks. Like two minutes in, we're already getting some nuggets. Fantastic. So there is a reason and a methodology behind that. And that goes into what I was going to ask you is you probably remember, and you have kids I know, um, but you probably remember sitting down and watching Cinderella, right? Or either as a, as a, as a little girl, maybe, or even now as, you know, as a mom, right? Okay. So during Cinderella, there's this critical scene where the clock has struck midnight and she's running down the staircase. She loses that glass slipper. She starts to turn back to get in. She's like, I gotta go. And she leaves it behind. And we all know the story. The prince finds it. The Duke goes out and searches all the land. But what, what has always struck me about that movie and this really, I think, fits into your wheelhouse, is Cinderella was surrounded by people in a house that were completely negative. They were beating her up, ripping her, I mean, ripping her the portals off of her shirt, ripping her clothes, putting her in the tower. Her only real source of encouragement, I mean, as weird as it sounds, were singing mice. That makes sense to me. Right? I talk to animals. Yeah. yeah. It totally makes sense to me. Yeah. Like talking to animals mm-hmm. is totally cool. I wish I could do that. But but th- that was her only source of encouragement. And I, so I'm wondering about you. Like, do you have that Cinderella moment in your life where you were just like kind of stuck in the tower? Not that a prince is going to come save the day for you per se, because I think that's a false narrative that we really sell little girls. Like the prince is out there somewhere. The magical prince will save you, you know, but, but what I do think is powerful about that movie is once Cinderella did put on that glass slipper, wrecking the movie for those who haven't seen it, which where have you been? Why have you not seen it? But once she put on that glass slipper, her life did change. She no longer was stuck in that negative house with the evil stepmother, with the evil stepsisters. And I think the mice and the friends came with her, but not the point, but she got out of that moment. She got unstuck. So, so Cammy, help me. Do you have one of those moments where you were just stuck? And again, that magical glass slipper maybe came along and got you unstuck. And if so, what was that like? Yeah. And it's interesting that you bring up that because I was, when I grew up, I actually grew up as more of a tomboy uh, because I was the only girl in the family. So it was kind of like cool to be tough. And so I don't, it's interesting. I don't resonate with that little girl princess story. What I resonate with is I'm in this alone. I'm just going to do it myself. I'm just going to be tough. I'm never going to show my feelings. And my mom and dad divorced when I was young. So when I was three and they moved across the country. So my mom was in Pennsylvania. My dad was in Idaho. So I spent time away from each of them, which was interesting because it allowed me to kind of, uh, close myself off easily to go, Oh, well, I'm going to go with dad. Now I'm going to go with mom. Now. What's also interesting is I became closed off because it, it would hurt me, right? It hurt me that my dad was far away. And I ended up getting into all of these bad relationships. It's interesting that you talk about the prince, right? Because we think that other person is somehow going to make us feel a certain way. And so I got into this relationship that I was in for nine years with this guy that had everything on the outside that looked good, right? Like, like good looking guy had a house, had like an escalade, you know, was into fitness and I thought I had won the prize because I knew everybody, every other girl wanted to be with him. And so I felt this sense of worthiness by being with him. However, the way he was treating me was not within my values. It was because of my own insecurity that 
I wouldn't speak up about what I thought was appropriate. And it was because what was modeled to me, right? You know, I, I heard things growing up, like you just need to accept the man and kind of don't try to change him and all of those things. So I had a lot of programming around that. And I was in that relationship for nine years. He was a military guy and we saw each other maybe once a year. He moved across the country without me. Like there were so many signs and so many opportunities for me to leave, but I never had this self-worth enough until I started, my transformation kind of started when I got fired uh, for the first time, which we'll talk about that. And I started getting into network marketing and network marketing is essentially what introduced me into personal development. And I started to notice like, yes, he is the problem, right? Like in the way he treat me, treats me is not correct, but I had to start looking and take responsibility for I'm allowing somebody to treat me like this and I'm not communicating my value and my expectation of my worth. And I always did that because I was afraid. I was afraid he would leave, but it's like, I'm more valuable than this. So I got to leave. So it, it did take me four years of working with coaches, hiring a relationship coach. I went to Bali. That was like my biggest transformation because I invested $4,000 in myself, which was like me, my way of saying like, it's my time and I'm worth this. And so I broke up with him. I went to Bali. I worked with male coaches, which is really interesting too, because working with the opposite sex helped me to heal my relationship and start to set an example for what I wanted to see in relationship. And so once I got really clear on my values, once I went through that whole process, I came out of Bali, you know, got on the dating app, was super clear on what I wanted. And I just got married last year. So I'm coming up on my one year anniversary to an amazing man, amazing husband, but I had to change in order to attract and allow somebody to be so good to me because who I was nine years ago would have never allowed this man to take such good care of me as he does now. Was it hard to finally admit to yourself that you maybe needed somebody in some respects by getting married, by getting married? Because it, it sounds like, and again, it's none of our business. What happened with your relationship? It really isn't. Some people are going to be like, why don't you ask more about her relationship and what happened? Like it's none of our business. And I, and I'm, and I'm going to respect that. But what I am wondering about is, if it was bad and from the sound of it, it kind of was probably had some challenges and, and anytime a relationship ends, there's always her side, his side, somewhere in the middle. We all know that too. But I guess what I'm trying to ask is when the new guy, the, the, the guy that you're with currently that you've been married to, which by the way, celebrating one year of marriage, keep going. We're at 19, my wife and I, and it's not always been, you know, Disney movies and Hallmark movies. I mean, it's been tough. It's been also some Lifetime movies, which the guy always is the villain, but that's another story. But what I guess what I'm trying to ask in that is when he came along, was there any kind of reluctance or or kind of, I'm not sure if I really want to, is he really who he says he is kind of thing? And, and do, you, do you know what I'm getting at with that? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting because you bring up like, self-trust because if you're with somebody for so long that you're like how did i allow myself to be with that person and it's interesting too because kind of the, the turnaround was i broke up with him in the beginning of 2018 and i was like dating a new guy by the end of 2018 and we were working towards marriage but really i i started the breakup process in my mind four years earlier and so I was like working towards it. And it was, there was some manipulation. There was some gaslighting. So every time I would go to break up with him, he would come somehow kind of manipulate me into staying with him a little bit longer. And I truly wanted to be married. And this relationship was never going to go there. Clearly he kept putting it off. He kept, you know, doing all the things, but it was interesting. And you brought up this point when I was entering the dating scene, first thing that happened was I was attracting the same type of guy. And it was kind of like, the test, like, do you really going to be different or are you going to go back to the same type of person? And so I was talking to this one guy for about a week. He wasn't respecting my boundaries. He wasn't respecting me. And I had to say, okay, we're done here, but it didn't mean it was easy because it was, it was filling that cycle again of the pattern. I, so it was like, I was like, Ooh, this kind of feels like an addiction. And so I broke that off then started dating, you know, my current husband. And we were both very clear from the get go. Like, what are your values? What are your intentions? Right. I was kind of ruthless on these dating apps. I wasn't messing around. I, I was here in it to win it. And um, so we were already talking about our intentions of marriage when we first started dating. But what's interesting is when he was like initiating that conversation of like, are we going to be boyfriend and girlfriend? I was like, 
I was not sure that I was ready because my definition of relationship was all this pain, all this hurt, never getting my needs met. And then I just like asked myself and started to reflect on why is this bothering me? Like, why don't I want to be in in a boyfriend, girlfriend relationship? And then I realized it's because before it meant this, and these are all the things. And I had been journaling for so many years of what I desired. So I went back to my journal and I just started underlining, like, this is what I want. This is what I desire. And I started going, oh, this is the guy. This is the guy I've been praying for for years. Like, this is it. And so it just took me reframing what relationship meant to me and living within the values that I had defined and being really clear about what I wanted. I think that's so valuable, right? When we, when you, and maybe even I'm part of the we on that, when we kind of start to identify the fact that, yes. listen, this is who I'm going to be. I'm going to put my feet firm in this, whatever it may be in this moment. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Sorry. The, Sound kind of cut out for a second, but we can be firm in that moment to say, Hey, this is who I am. And I'm not backing down from that. Almost like we put our feet in concrete and we're saying, we're not moving from this spot. We're just not. And we're not going to compromise on that. Like, well, you know, I know, I know I wanted this, but he, I mean, he has that. And, and could I, I could overlook that. I could get him to not do that anymore. I could, You know, my wife might have said to me, you know, that's two dollars now. This is going to really cost me big time. But uh, but, you know, she could somehow in her mind think, well, you know, I I could get him to stop liking North Carolina somehow. I I could try. It's probably not going to happen. But but I love that you didn't compromise on that and that you didn't say, hey, I'm going to try to fix this person because really maybe, you know, we have the savior kind of complex. I don't know. Right. I don't know. Maybe I'm just talking out of left field, but. But no, I love that in you, in you that you kind of stood firm in that. So I'm wondering about this because I know, and I know only guys, I don't necessarily know what it's like to be a lady. Sorry, just don't. But I would imagine that some ladies on some level probably struggle with perfection and perfectionism, right? Has anywhere in your journey, has that been part of your story? And if so, how did you kind of, kind of switch the channel on that for you? And this is interesting. I think it could relate to both male and female, both because it's societal paradigms that define perfectionism for us, like what it means to be perfect. So, and I work with both men and women, so I like to address both sides. So maybe your, your coach, your football coach, your basketball coach told you there was a certain way that you were going to perform that you weren't able to be good enough, or you needed to get straight A's to be good enough. And then on the flip side for, for females or people who identify as female or maybe have the female role of the caregiver is you got to be the good mom. You got to be a good cook. You got to also go to work, right? You have to do all of it and you have to do all of it perfectly. And you're not allowed to break down. Like you just got to do it all yourself. So how that showed up for me was like very, you know, I would say traditional uh, values of uh, go to church, get straight A's, be the best athlete, like be nice to people, all of those things. And because of my childhood, uh, I grew up with a a emotionally and physically abusive stepfather. I started to get some of that anger and resentment. So I was always like lashing out and rebelling. So on the outside, I was like scholar, athlete, straight A student. But on the other side, I was smoking and drinking and partying. So I was always rebelling. And it's interesting because I always went for the guys that that made me feel good somehow. Right. It was like always a bad guy. But this perfectionism comes from what we've been programmed with from the ages of about one to seven or eight years old. We are a walking subconscious mind. So anything, which means anything that is said to you, you're good because you cleaned your room or you're bad because you didn't, you start to identify that. And so our work in our adult life is to unprogram all of those systems that weren't necessarily put there on purpose to make us feel bad. You know, somebody just might say, Hey, don't be bad make sure you clean your room, but you internalize it as I'm not bad. And so-and-so doesn't love me or my, my teacher is hates me because I got a bad grade. So the first thing is awareness on where it comes from. The second thing is to go, okay, if it's still pervasive in my life, is it serving me? So, cause I was putting it on my resume for years when I was still working in jobs, I was like perfectionist. And I was like putting it as a good thing, but 
how perfectionism so- shows up for you to start to reflect upon is procrastination because you're, you're like, I don't want to do it if I don't do it perfectly. So maybe you wanted to start a podcast and you didn't because it, you want to do it perfect or a blog or whatever. It also shows up as self judgment. So you're, you're harshly always judging yourself to the point where you always are like, you know what? I could have done better. I never did good enough. And it shows up as being highly critical of others. So maybe if you're a mom and there's a certain way that you load the dishwasher, you won't allow your kids to help you because you've identified this is the right way to do it. And so therefore you're putting more work on yourself and you're not, you know, maybe giving responsibility to your kids because there's a judgment there. So after self-awareness, after saying, okay, this is not working for me, then it goes into, I call it, it's the antidote to perfectionism, which is practicing your potential. Like you said, if I'm choosing to step into this new way of being, the only way for me to get there is to practice and not take it so seriously. So maybe one step in the direction of you practicing is saying, okay, I'm committed to being a recovering perfectionist today. And I'm going to let my kids do the dishes and put them in the dishwasher, even though I know they're not going to do it the way that, that I would. And just allow that and just notice what thoughts and feelings come up. And as you start to practice, you start to find freedom. And then you start to just be like, oh, it's not even a big deal. I'm just going to start this block. Cool. I'm not making it mean anything about me and my self-worth. I'm just going, you know, I want to build a better life where I'm not as stressed and anxious. And these are the baby steps I'm going to take along the way. First off, I, th- I think that is so great. And I love I love that you said that because you sent to us this this statement, that, that exact statement. So I just want to make sure that it's super clear and maybe really articulated well. And I'm going to do my very best to, to do that. You, of course, can jump in and, and make sure I do it because it is your, your statement here. And then that's this. It's not about being perfect. It's about practicing your potential. Why? I mean, like, first off, where does your mind go to to get to that point? Are you able to walk that back with us at all? Yeah. Yeah. So th- I find this to be really, really beneficial. And I did this exercise in Bali with one of my coaches. Everything that you have in your life right now, like the first thing to do is just to take responsibility for your part in it. And that's going to hurt. You're going to be like, no, he did this or she does that. And right. You're going to want to place blame and judgment, which is what I did for years. But what I realize is if I want a different life, I must create that different life by becoming a different person who has the capacity to live that life. So I'm like, okay, I, I get that. Now, how do I do it? So what I think of is going ahead five to 10 years from now, starting to think about what your ideal life would look like. If you could create anything, time and money wasn't an issue. You lived in the house you wanted, you had the relationship you wanted and you just like kind of time traveled in your mind and you talked to the future you, right? Your potential, your potential self in the future who has everything you want. And you can even imagine sitting across in a chair like you and I are. Does your potential self care about any excuse that you have coming up? Oh, I can't because, all right. So it is truly using your future self as your coach, as your mentor going, nope, she doesn't care. She has the life that she wants. And she's like, oh no, I know you don't want to because it hurts or it makes you sad. But on the other side of sadness or discomfort is the life that you want. Look, I'm already living it over here. So I use that to go, yeah, yep. The things that I desire that my future self already has, she is not going to sit here and listen to my excuses. She is committed to my future and what we're co-creating together. So then you can just go, oh yeah, cool. I get it now. And you could start to act as if you're already your potential self. So what would she do? What should, what would she wear? You know, for me, when I came, when I came back from Bali, I cut my hair, I dyed it pink. I put a nose ring in, right? The reason I did that was for, and I got a tattoo also, it says renewed, right? We are, we are, we are constantly renewing our minds day by day, but by me being in Bali, I transformed who I was being and I wasn't going to come back to the U S and go back to my old self. So me changing my appearance reminded me every time I looked in the mirror, no, we're a new person now. And I can tell I'm new because I have pink hair. And so that's really useful to change the way you look to maybe put on your favorite shirt or your like your favorite robe or your house slippers that are like your, your future self shoes, right? You can put on those shoes. And I've used this with clients. I've said, you know, when you're the person that makes that type of money, what shoes would you be wearing? And he's like, oh, well these shoes, right? 
what shoes would you be wearing? And he's like, well, I wear these shoes. And, but he's like, but I only wear them for special occasions. I'm like, yeah, but future you would just wear them around the house and just be like, these are the shoes I wear because it's who I am. So you can actually practice literally putting on the shoes of your future self. And maybe they're not the, the real pair that you want to get, like the $7,000 pair, but maybe they're like the $99 pair, right? So you're, you're working with what you have, but you're stepping into the shoes of your future self. I absolutely love that because I feel like you just gave me permission to go buy some shoes. Is that what I'm hearing in that? I just want to make sure. Yeah. Well, what I was saying is, what I was saying was wearing the shoes that you have. No, I, I, I'm no, I'm pretty sure you said wear buy more shoes. That's no, that's my takeaway. No, I'm totally playing, but but I'm serious. Like I have never in my life heard that thought process before. I'm serious. That like you, they can't see me, but I'm doing like the mind blown like sign. We all know that one. Because I am like, that is such a new thought for me to really think about. It's not about me right now, but, but I'm going to sort of make it about me for a second, but to think about what the future Neil is going to be doing, what's he going to be wearing? Because I'm such a, and I think guys in general, we're visual people. We just are, we're just, I wish we weren't sometimes, but we are. But to think about visually, where am I at? What am I wearing? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? What am I, you know, again, what clothes am I putting on? And I, I love what you said. What shoes am I putting on? Right. I love that because I wonder, and, and again, I, I know we're, you're not a big fan of the Cinderella analogy and, and not that you're hating on Cinderella, but, but she never envisioned being any place other than that tower. She could never see herself getting out of that place. I bet. Well, so here's what she had. This is a really, really good thing because if somebody is struggling or suffering or in a circumstance that feels really hard, what gets you out of that is hope. So she didn't understand or know, but she was just like, I don't really like this. And I have hope that there's something more. And I don't really know how that's going to show up for me. But she had hope and faith that it would. And she followed what felt good. Like she followed like, I'm just going to talk to the birds because that makes me feel good. And that's really all I have in this moment. So I'm going to talk to the mice and the birds and the animals. And I'm just going to keep myself, you know, she, she never lost her values or her integrity. She was always kind. So she never let herself change because of the circumstance that she was in. And she never let herself steer away from her own values. 100%. And I, I love that you went with me on that analogy and you actually made it better, which is what's so great about kind of meeting people and, and thought processes and all that. So I want to get into something, maybe if we can kind of change gears just a little bit, but I think we're still building on, on, on this foundation of this stuck and getting out of, un, you know, this unstuck moment. But I'm wondering about this because I think somewhere along the way we have to come, I have to come to a point of saying, listen, I can't worry about what others see. I got to worry about what they can't see and really build on that. And so that's what I'm wondering about. Is there anything in your mind and your life that really could help us understand that better? So I want to make sure I understand the question. What it sounds like is what others see of me or what others see Maybe of my both, circumstance. Because I think, again, we're such a visually driven society, male or female alike. I just know guys in general are more visual, right? Blaming, blaming guys a little bit there. But, but I think so many times, right, we see somebody, we look at them, male or female, and we're like, oh, I know, I know who you are. I know, you know, we start judging the book cover, as I like to say, or book jacket. And we don't ever really get deep inside that person to really see the essence of who they are. And I think... Again, just to make it more personal, going back to Cinderella, she again had so many people just looking at her and dumping on her and, and, and feeding in those negative thoughts. And so she finally had to say, listen, I'm not who you think I am. I'm going to one day be something amazing. Now, again, we know she comes on to be the princess and they live happily ever after, but that's a fairy tale. But reality, somebody has to get to that mindset of saying, listen, in my, in my belief, right? I'm a child of the king. I'm a beloved child of the king. Like I have to walk as such, but sometimes I walk defeated. Let's be honest. I walked, you know, flat. I, I, I've been fired from jobs. I mean, you talk about hope. I'm sorry. You, you, you can't go down to Costco and say, okay, uh, Mr. or Miss associate, where's the hope at? 
Like, is it in the freezer section? Is it over with the eggs, like with all the clothes? Is it with the lawn furniture? Is it in the tools and the electronics? Like, where can I buy hope? I'm here to buy hope today. And people at Costco are going to look at you like you're crazy. And so that's what I'm wondering, I guess, all of that to say, how did you get out of all of that? Because you, you talk about a moment, right, where that light switch was flicked, where you finally had to say, okay, enough's enough. I'm going to Bali. I'm going to come back with pink hair, maybe a tat, nose ring. This is this is good. I'm glad you, you added more to that. Well, I was just trying to help you because so I feel like essentially, I feel like I didn't give enough. So no, it's I gave great. A little more. It, it, no, it's no, it's great. It gave me it totally gave me time to 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 give a, a story. But I want to go to essentially we're saying we are all a fractal of God, no matter what your belief is. And I call myself an intuitive life coach because I coach people from all religions, all backgrounds. I grew up Christian, but I also know that sometimes the language that we use, the G-O-D, sometimes may separate people actually because they have something religious from their history or their background and somebody hurt them who was religious. So what I say is we are all divinely created. We are in the image of God, all of us, no matter what your belief is. And it is easy to let the world tell you what you are to get into comparison with all of the social media platforms to get into this is, this is, or is not in my bank account, or I am, or am not married or whatever your status is. And so when you're asking about how how do we get hope, how do we cultivate it? Where do we find it? Sometimes your rock bottom is your best place to be because there's nowhere else to go from there, but up. And so if you've had a moment that you're just like, this actually, I believe is the worst moment in my life. That is when you can make a 1% shift to just go, and I'm open to something better than this. That window, and I have goosebumps when I say it, that window of just being like, I'm open to something better, just like Cinderella. She didn't know, but she was like, I know that I am more than this. And she holds herself to that standard because she doesn't lower herself to what's going on in her circumstances. She doesn't react. She doesn't get mean. She goes, no, I know what I'm worth. I know that I'm supposed to treat people with kindness. She also knows that she's supposed to be treated with kindness, but she doesn't drop down, right? She's like, I know things are working out for me. And I have a story that I think can help highlight this. When I got out of college i have a degree in molecular cell biology i wanted yeah, yeah uh, low key first I, off you, you can't can, judge a book you, by its cover uh, on that either. Go, like, i gotta have a yeah. breakdown on that like really quick just just tell me what that is because yeah. like i'm not a science nut so it's like it's like pre yeah it, it's pre-med so it's essentially like the cells and the structure of the cells and dna and things like that because i wanted to be a veterinarian because i love animals right but this brings me to another point i was going down this path that everybody else told me i should right you should do this and you should get straight A's and then you should go to this school and then you should do that. And the whole time I wasn't happy and I wasn't fulfilled. So this led me to seeking a job right out of college for security. And so I got the job. I was working in a laboratory. And when I got the job, I was like, I know I'm going to hate this, but I'm just going to do it for a year. And that was literally my strategy for every job I took for about nine years when I was in that nine year relationship, because I just thought that's what you do. You just suffer through everything You don't get to have what you want because that was my paradigm. So I was in this laboratory and again, I was on night shift and I was, I was working in a pathology laboratory, which is I received human body parts and I cut up the body parts. That was literally my job. So if you ever get a mole removed, a gallbladder, any fatty tissue, they send it to the lab and I would be the one cutting it up. And so I remember because it was night shift, it was Christmas time. And I was sitting in front of this bucket, this big old red bucket of pathological waste. And I worked with formaldehyde, which is highly toxic. And I had this little indicator that would say whether or not I was getting exposed too much to cause reproductive harm. And I, and my job was to separate the formaldehyde from the fatty human tissue. And I'm sitting there in that moment, crying, listening to the Christmas music and just going and looking into this literal bucket of pathological waste going, I know my life is meant for more than this. And I can even feel it now where I was just like, I know this isn't it. Like I, I didn't know what it was, but I knew that this wasn't it for me. And so I go back to that moment and I'm getting a little choked up because I think about anytime anything gets hard in my business now, because being an entrepreneur has its challenges, but anytime 
that I think about, oh, you know, this happened or this happened or this challenge came up, I can look back and be like, but I used to be dumping pathological waste in a bucket and I'm not doing that anymore. And I'm so grateful for my journey and where I've gone. And I can go to my future and go, and I know what I'm creating. I know that by me sharing my story, I'm touching and impacting one person who then changes the future of their family and future generations. And I see that when we change ourselves, it's how we change the world. So that moment, that's how you cultivate hope is just going, I know there's something better. And I'm just going to take the next best step to what feels good for me. Wow. First off, I, I want to tell you that I love what you just shared because I'm, I, I know this sounds maybe a little creepy on some level, but I felt like I was in the room with you. Like maybe I'm sitting on the counter or something and I'm just kind of like watching as this kind of scene unfolds. And I'm hearing, I don't know, maybe it's Winter Wonderland. That's my favorite Christmas song. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was like Rudolph comes, you know, Rudolph has a red nose. I don't know. But in that moment, I'm th- I'm, I'm seriously like thinking like you're stuck in that waste. You're stuck in that toxic waste like we were talking about with Cinderella. And, and, and you have that moment that's like, listen, I know there's a glass slipper that's going to get me unstuck. And... And I know, I know because, you know, you shared this with me a little bit before we started recording that there's been a series of moments where you were like, man, I'm, I'm stuck, but I got to keep going. I, I'm stuck. I'm, I'm, I mean, you talk about, you know, with, with me and I want to let everyone else in on our conversation that you've had a number of jobs and we laughed because I too have had a number of jobs and, you know, I kind of said, you know, kindred spirits, you know, doing our taxes and we have seven W2s or whatever it may be, right? Because we just can't find that contentment. We can't find that satisfaction that really fulfills us. And so again, if somebody right now is in that moment and they're stuck in that moment and they're hearing this and they're like, you know what, what Cammie's saying is so good. I've been in this toxic waste. I've been in the formaldehyde. I, I'm, I'm, I'm drenched in it. Cause it smells, I, I think it does. Right. Has just a nasty mm-hmm. odor. Yeah. It yeah. Does. It has a nasty yeah, has odor itself. to it. Yeah. You know, and, and then they're like, I'm just covered in it. What, what would you, what would you go back in time? You talk about future you, let's talk about past you. How would future you go back and tell that girl, that young lady with tears in her eyes as they're streaming down to say, listen, you're going to, you're not even going to believe this. We're going to go to Bali. You're going to have pink hair. I know. I know you don't, you maybe don't like pink. Maybe you didn't even have the tattoo then, but, but guess what? You're going to get a tattoo. Would she believe would pass Cammy crying with the formaldehyde? Would she believe future Cammy right now? If you went back and talked to her. So this is a really, really good question because what I teach is creating a movie script. If you could create, and you can see, you can see on here, I have my vision boards behind me, which are my, my visions for the future and what I'm creating. And so I, I say, start journaling about what your craziest ideal life could look like because you absolutely never know. So it allows you to step into possibility and, and actually believe that these things are possible for you. And you could start looking for evidence of other people who have done it, who have come from similar circumstances and situations. So I was always reading books, always listening to podcasts of people who even had it worse off than me. I was always listening to people who came from like a prisoner of war situation or a really hard situation, or they're a Navy SEAL where I'm like, if they can get through being blown up, I surely can get through this moment, right? It's not to negate your moment, but it's just to give you perspective and to add a little bit of perseverance to your spirit. And then the other thing that I knew, and this is interesting, I think our higher self and God source, whatever you believe in is always co creating creating with us and these intuitive hits, these YouTube videos that come up at the right time, these books that come into our awareness, they are placed there by a divine source that is leading us on our path. And sometimes it takes us to be in that moment to finally be like, okay, I'm willing to take responsibility. I'm willing to start looking at these things. I'm so miserable that I'm going to start reading a personal development book. And that was my situation. But what I realized in that moment is my higher self was with me then because 
I was in perpetual prayer for eight hours because that's the only thing actually for 10 hours because I usually work overtime. That's the only thing that literally kept me from crying. I was just like, thank you, God. Okay. I have money. Okay. And I was just in prayer and gratitude and prayer and gratitude. Like I have money. I have a 401k. And I just kept looking at what I did have. And Cinderella had it the same, right? She had a roof over her head. There wasn't definitely an abusive situation there, but she was fed. She was clothed, right? She did have some things for which to be grateful. And even if you can just say, I'm grateful I'm still alive. That is the most basic. I'm grateful that my body works. I'm grateful that I can put one leg in front of another. And that's where I think perspective comes in when you start to think of there's some people that got blown up or that don't have use of their legs. Or I have a friend whose brother grew up with cystic fibrosis, which was like breathing through a straw for 25 years until he got a lung transplant. So every breath that I take is actually a miracle and a blessing. So finding that gratitude, even if it feels feels hard, even if it feels small, that is one of the best places to start. I think that's great because again, I think the reminder would be in that moment, again, if you could somehow go back in time and, and talk to that, that Cammy back then, I think the reminder is that, Hey girl, you're going to be okay. And, and to be that comfort, I guess the flip side of that, do you think in that moment, tears again, the prayer of gratitude. Hey, at least I have a job. At least I have money. You know, I got the 401. You got all the gots, right? I got, I got, I got. But do you think in any way she would believe the present you? Would she believe you? And why not? No. Mm -mm. She'd be like, so it's interesting. I've always had this dichotomy. Like even when I was a kid, like I'm going to be great, right? But I never really knew what that was. And I never really, and you know, I've been published in magazines. Like there's a lot of things that have happened that I've told people they're like, no, no, no. And I'm like, yeah, but they're, they're going to happen. So I guess I can answer this in two ways of like somewhere inside me, I know, I know that I'm going to know Oprah, but like, do I really know? Like, you know what I mean? So I'm like, yes, I believe it. But like, when you get there, you're almost like, it's even way different and better than I could have ever even imagined, but I'm still going to imagine it. Right. And so no, I, I, North Carolina wasn't on my radar. Like none of this is on my radar other than one step at a time feeling better. Like just getting a job I liked, which led me to like, I don't like any of these. I want to be a life coach. Like, right. So, <laughs> but I had to go through that process of finding what I liked and allowing myself to be okay with essentially going against the societal norm, which says we're meant to be miserable and suffer. Well, I think it goes back into what you were talking about, about, about the perfection aspect of it, right? Practicing your potential, not perfection. I, I know I kind of messed that up a little bit, but but I think that that falls into play that you really got to start practicing that potential and really walking it out. And I think you're, you're really from the sound of it, you're really not only preaching it, but you're really kind of practicing it as well. Right. Yeah. Oprah's on my vision board. I talk about her all the time. So you could say I knew her before Oprah. That'll be a good conversation. Well, I mean, do, do you, do you want me to call her? Yeah. Let's call Would her. Would you like me to talk to her? Yeah. We, I mean, we had lunch last week. Perfect. I mean, if you're dogs. interested. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Let's do it. Right, totally cool. Enough. We can hang out. Uh, yeah. Oprah and I go way back. Like, yeah. oh man, we, so many, I have so many Oprah stories. No, just <laughs> Everybody's like, you all know Oprah? No, 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 no. But Cammy, I'm just curious because I think everybody's story has value. Everybody's important. I think you can learn something from everyone that is that you interact with. I firmly believe that. I don't care if it's in your mind, maybe the homeless guy on the side of the road. You're like, really? Can I learn something from him? Yes, you can. If it's, you know, the most popular girl in school that you think was so uppity and out of your range, could you learn from her? Yes. Whether you like Donald Trump or not, whether you like, you know, President Biden or not, in my mind, you can learn from both, right? So if somebody's sitting here today and they're like, listen, Neil, I learned some stuff. I love what Cammy's saying. Like I do. I'm, I've been stuck. I'm, 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 I'm looking through the waist. I'm trying to get that stink off of me because nobody likes BO. Nobody. I don't care who you are. Nobody likes the smell. But if they're sitting there right now and they're stuck in their stink, ooh, see what I did there? Yeah. If they're stuck, help them. And, and how can somebody reach out to you and get connected with you to maybe help them you know, see the reality of their future self, how can, how can people do that right now? 
Yeah. So I'll kind of share the what things that I did all the time that I was not doing anything or I was doing something that didn't require my full attention, podcast, audiobook, YouTube video, mindset all day long, people's stories, right? Like I made mindset my actual job. When I was at my jobs and I hated them, I'd be listening to meditations going, you are patient, you are tolerant. Like I would literally be like, this guy. <laughs> and they would be like, you are patient, you are tolerant. I'm like, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Like, <laughs> So I'm telling you this from experience that like people- I got to interject. I'm laughing yeah, so hard. She's yeah. like losing her thought because I'm like blowing my mind right now <laughs> again because I'm laughing so hard. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yeah. I, you were kind of losing your thoughts. So I was trying to help help get it back again. But that's so funny that you got it like the headphones on and you're like yeah. folding laundry at May or folding clothes at Macy's and you're like- you're yeah. awesome. Yeah. You're amazing. Cammy, you're going to be fantastic. Yes. Oprah wants to talk to you. <laughs> yes. Sorry, so, and, go, and, go back and, to your story. Well, and that's what it is, right? Is our, our natural default, our language in our brain is very negative. It's like, you suck, you're horrible, you failed. And, and then everybody from the outside is also telling you that. So in order for you to change any of that, you have to make it your actual job to reprogram your mind. So you can do that through, I, I, I do a morning routine. That is essential, right? So some people start with scripture and prayer or meditation, journaling, but simply audios of other people who have created a better life than you. And you could start to learn from what they've done and you could start to pick up. You know, I listened to Tony Robbins for years. I eventually went to one of his programs, right? So when you get to the point where you're ready to invest and you're ready to take it next level, I'm happy to work with you. This is what I do. I work with people one-on-one, -on -one, but I also say, the timing in the teacher is going to show up for you. So if you're already just listening and you're saying, I'm willing, I guarantee you in the next hour or one minute, you're going to get a text or you're going to get a book or you're going to get a YouTube recommendation of like, watch this video. So I want you to really connect to that, those synchronicities that are showing up for you because support is always there when we open ourselves up to support. When we close ourselves off to it, it's not there because we create our own reality. But when you allow support to be there, it's going to come at you in all different forms. Okay. So I don't know how this is going to come across audio wise. So we're going to try it here. Uh, so help our, help my listeners out. What am I doing currently with my hand? You are, I know that holding it in a, weird. you are holding it in a fist. Thank you. So I'm holding it into a fist. And if my fist is so clenched and you can see the, the blood kind of coming out of my, you know, going away from my hands, but if it is so clenched so hard, how can anything get into this? Right? Cause that's what I hear you say in that. And so I'm going to tell you right now, if you're a listener and you're hearing Cammy and you're super excited about what she's saying and you, you just, it's resonating with you, Cammy, how can people get in touch with you about getting more of your help and more of your encouragement and more of your coaching? Cause really that's what, it, what, what you can help with, right? Yes. Yeah. So I have a bunch of ways that they can work with me in freebies and free videos and the way they can find that is going cammykennedy.com forward slash links. So they can find my free Facebook group. They can book a consult with me. They can get my free meditations. So I would just go there and see what you're guided to. And then I would love to connect with anybody on Instagram. And if Clubhouse is still a thing, then I will be on Clubhouse as well. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I was actually going to tell you a, a quick story on me. So I hit a pretty stuck moment for me. Uh, I was on staff at a church. Some things changed. Part of it was my doing self-sabotaging, things like that occurred. And so I ended up wanting to leave the church that I grew up in, became on staff with. And in that moment, I went to my mother-in-law, which some people are like, whoa, that's a big step. I love my mother-in-law dearly. She's fantastic. She's been on the show previous. But I went to her and I said, mom, in that moment, I'm like, I, I need my mommy, right? Mom, I said, I don't know what to do. And she said, fast and pray for three days and see what God does. I'm like, okay. Never really done that, but okay. So, you know, I'm fasting, I'm praying, drinking lots of water, and I go to get gas, and I go into the gas station to get gas like everyone. Like here in Oregon, we can't pump our own gas, right? So I had to go in and pay. It was the thing. As I'm walking by the newspaper, back then they had newspapers like regularly coming out. It said, moving on, South Medford soccer moves on. Well, South Medford is my old high school. So it caught my attention, right? South Medford. And it said, moving on. I just thought. Interesting. Moving on. Hmm. Okay. Whatever. Didn't think anything of it. Driving down the road, not even paying attention. I drive the same way every day, going to and from work. And I see this sign that says, hurts, habits, and hangups. We can help you. 
New Beginnings Church. I thought, has that sign always been there? Like, this was in the next couple of days, right? Like, like the gas thing, then this, right? So then I'm taking my daughter to a friend of ours up where we live. And so I'm driving down. They live up by the golf course, really nice area. So I'm driving down this hill, and it's kind of windy road and, you know, kind of coming down and into where, you know, my neighborhood is. And this song, like, I just happen to turn on the radio. Like, I usually stream music. Like, that's just me. It's kind of what I do. But I turn on the radio for some reason. And the song by Brandon Heath, and I don't know if you know him, and if you don't, that's fine. But this song comes on, and, and, and the line, as I catch the end of this line, it says, he's not finished with you yet. I need a moment now. Because I think for so many people, they think they're finished. They think there's just absolutely no way they can get out of that lab. There's no way, going back to Cinderella, that they can get out of that tower. But I love that there's people like you in this world that say, hey, you're not finished yet. In fact, I want to help you get to that finish line so you can feel like what it feels like to finish, to really finish, because you're not done yet. By the way, I pulled my car over and wept, and I put my hands in the air and I said, what do you want from me? You are here to be that voice to say, listen, I want something so much more for you and I can help you do that, right? You, you made such a good point on the transition, which is willingness, surrender. Had you not been willing to do something different, fast and pray and surrender to actually say, okay, God, what I've been doing is not working. I would like an intervention now. Those two things are the ingredients. That's your first step. So if you're listening and you're just like, okay, I'm, I know I'm willing. I don't want this life like this anymore. That's the first step. And I can actually absolutely help you. And if I'm not the one that can help you, I'll send you to somebody that can help you. But there is help and support for everyone, which is why I love the industry that I'm in, because there are so many life coaches, so many different backgrounds that are going to be specific that can help you with whatever it is that you need help with. Thank you for letting me tell my story, by the way. Thank you for sharing that. Well, I just felt comfortable sharing that with you. Yeah. You you allowed that to happen too. So I just want to give people that comfort level that that's what you're going to do. And and by the way, Kimmy's not coming on here. She's not kicking down any coins. So somebody's going to be like, you getting paid to say that? No, I'm not. She's just a fantastic person. And I love soul to soul us having this amazing interaction today. So Kimmy, uh, are you, do you like games? I hope. I, it depends on what kind of game. I'm, I'm a okay, little competitive. So I'll say that. I kind of had a feeling you're kind of competitive. Yeah. So I'm like, like what sports uh, did you play again? Remind me of that. So I played volleyball and I ran track. Okay, what event did you do in track? Wait, let me guess. Hurdles. You were a sprinter. Yes, I was a sprinter. I kind of had a feeling. I couldn't do long distances, which is funny because my husband can run long distances, and I'm like, no, thank you, sir. Yeah. 400 yards, that's my limit. Yeah. Down to the mailbox, maybe back, but yes. yeah, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, so we play this game at the end of our show. It's called Senseless, and being a coach and being a life coach, I would imagine, and, and being in the former anatomy that you were kind of doing stuff, yeah. you're aware that we have five senses, I hope, right? Yes. Okay. And we have another sense. Like, we have an intuitive sense, too. Whoa. Yeah. hi That's that sixth so, sense. So sixth sense? <laughs> yeah. I see dead people. Anyway, so we play this game. Uh, so uh, I know you're not a big North Carolina fan, but you probably see this all around town. Yes. <clears throat> but if you happen to, I don't know, find an extra large shirt just laying on the ground, right. I'll send you my address. Okay. Just saying. Perfect. All right. So we play this game. It's called Senseless. It's just kind of a fun way to end the show. And so uh, I like to do it. And so this actually represents the number one, believe it or not, on the die. Uh, it's the North Carolina course. logo. It's a North Carolina die. Right. Look at that. Number How one. fun is that? <laughs> This is I told great. You, it's really bad here. This it's is really great. bad. So anyway, so we play this game called Senseless. So here's a just a fun question just to kind of wrap up the show with. And then I want to give you just one last opportunity just to share anything that may be on your heart. So here's the game, Senseless, as I said. Um, question number one is this. How do you want, and I don't know how this works, but the die usually knows what we've been talking about. Just saying. Okay. It's weird. It's super creepy. And this is so That's fitting. So sense, how right? do you want, yeah, right? <laughs> how do you want others to see you? How do you want others to see Cammy? Mm, authentic, transparent, safe. Yeah, those are my words. Wow. Do, do you do like a word of the year? Is that something you're in your wheelhouse? Or so I, I do, do. I do different things every year depending on what I'm guided. But my word this year is grounded. 
Okay. Which is just being present, sure. not trying to do everything. Um, but what I really, my vision is that people can accept who they are when they're in my presence and not feel judgment. That's awesome. I have never been a word of the year person. And so I speaking in a clubhouse, I stumbled into a clubhouse room that they were talking about word of the year. So to set the stage clubhouse, for those that don't know, we've talked about it a couple of times. It's basically like, think about the old school chat room, but it's like a giant conference call. You go into these rooms that are, you know, theme, theme specific. There's the word. And so you can kind of interact and it's through your phone. You're not typing. It's all audio. So for those of us that like to talk, such as myself, it's like the perfect app for us. We don't have to type stuff. I don't have to worry about trying to spell words right or wrong. It's it's awesome. And there's but no I video, went into this room. which is also great. Yeah, there's there's no video. So for those that are self-conscious, it's perfect, right? But, uh, but anyway, the reason why I say that is because I went into a room one day, and by the way, it was all ladies. There's like 20 of them, which I was the only dude, and I was like, I think I'm in the wrong room. But they were talking about word of the year. And so it came to me, there's a whole process of Clubhouse. If you want to ask me about it, con connect with me and I'll tell you all about it. But I say that because they asked me like, what's the, what's your word of the year? And I was like, uh, I feel weird saying this because I've never had one before. And they're like, really? This is the first, first year? And I said, yeah. And it's weird because I kept hearing this word. One word was stuck. The second word I kept hearing in everything that I was doing, talking with people, you talk about people interacting with you, things coming along at the right time, which I believe was empower. And so now kind of my whole mindset has shifted. How can I empower people to be the best that they can be? Not from a bragging standpoint, but really change their life. And so anyway, Kami, I want to give you just one last opportunity to share with us what you would want to share if somehow we were in this amazing sports stadium, which you're probably not accustomed to. But but just imagine you're a sports fan for a second. Like what if I hand you the microphone, what would you say to the to the crowd there from maybe ages sixteen to I don't know, sixty five? What would you say to them? You are enough right now in this moment. There is nothing wrong with you. There is nothing that needs to be fixed. You are divine and you are okay and you are on your way. That is so good. And I think we needed to hear that. So if you needed to hear that today, I would just invite you to rewind that. Rewind what she just said and hear it one more time and maybe somehow put it on a loop. Mm -hmm. You know, why are you folding that long? I, I do have affirmations on Insight Timer if they want to find me on Insight Timer. Oh, that's good. So they can oh, listen awesome. to Is that on? It's, a, okay, it's on an in... app called Insight oh, Timer. Oh, it's an app. Yeah. And I'll oh, link cool. it. I'll so... put it in my links so it'll be available. Oh, perfect. We will definitely link that. I didn't even. That's so cool. I didn't. That's me being a bad host. Sorry. No, that's okay. I have so many <laughs> things and it, we, we're not here to talk about all of them, but if it can serve right. them, then I want to I want to provide it. To that you. is a great serve, I feel like. And that's a great give. As we say so often on Clubhouse, what's your gift? <laughs> That's a great gift. Uh, Cam, you're fantastic, by the way. I, I love your energy. I love what you brought today. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. This is such a fun connection. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure. And guys, I, I just, I just want to let you know this before we close out today. Now, I know some of you are already having hiccups. Like, I don't need a life coach. Life coaches are stupid. Ugh. Like, I know you're already maybe thinking that, but I'm going to challenge you and I'm going to push super hard on that. And here's my big push super hard on that. You have to know somebody right now that's stuck, that's drenched in formaldehyde and smelling up the high heaven. Small story, my wife and I were at Walmart with my daughter one night. And for whatever reason, we walked down this aisle and it smelled like poo-poo, like caca. And you can insert another word in there. I'm true. This is a true story. And my daughter's like, dad, we got to get out of here. Oh, it's just, oh, it's just like, she couldn't even focus in the line. And, and she's like her mom. She's kind of centered and focused and not a lot of stuff derails this young little lady. Mm -hmm. And I'm there too. And gagging because we're wearing our mask and I'm like, babe, come on. Can, I'll get it tomorrow. Whatever we need. We just got to get out of here. And I want to challenge you in that. If you're stuck right now and you need to get out of there, my friend, and I think I can say this with confidence, my friend Cammie and so many other people want to help you get unstuck. But in order to do that, you got to take that step. And that step may be the scariest step you've ever taken in your life. But I want to challenge you right now. Can you take that step for me? 
And in fact, if you do, I would love to know about it. I would love to hear about it. In fact, I would love to empower you, my word, and encourage you in that because I feel like that is my job going forward is to empower you and encourage you and to walk with you in mercy along the way. So if you do that, will you just reach out to me, OPSpodcast.com, connections, leave me a little note there, or even send me a voicemail, drop it on the website, OPSpodcast.com. You can do that there as well. Just want to thank my guest, Cammie, one more time. Thank you, Cammie, so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And guys, just stay tuned till next week. But before I let you go, remember this. Remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Again, want to say thank you so much for listening and stay tuned till next week when we walk in other people's shoes.